Thank you all for joining tonight's webinar, Strategies for Calf Weaning in a Dry Season. I'm Penny Keynes, Project Manager at Livestock SA, and I also have my colleague Georgie Trowbridge as co-host tonight. This webinar tonight has been made possible has been made possible by our partners from Ag Resilience, the, which is a part of the Farm Business Resilience Program, an initiative of the Commonwealth Government's Future Drought Fund and the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. Tonight's presenter is Ashley Wachtel, who you may know more commonly by her maiden name, Ash Hunt. Ashley is the principal consultant at Tailored Livestock Consulting based at Robe in the Southeast. She has 11 years experience in livestock industry after graduating from a Bachelor of Agricultural Sciences at the University of Adelaide. Ash predominantly focuses on intensive and pasture-based sheep and beef production systems to improve feed efficiency, health of the animal and the amount of saleable product produced. This year's challenge has meant most of her consulting has been around planning, budgeting and managing containment feeding, lambing and calving requirements and early weaning. Thank you, Penny. And thank you to everyone for joining tonight. So today we're going to be learning about managing stress in your system. I understand that everyone's got different facilities and I'm going to try to, as best as I can, dis discuss different systems. Managing age and weight targets, early weaning, feeding these weaners for success and managing our cow condition score for rebreeding purposes. So as you can see on the table in front of you. This is a table to show cow energy requirements. Obviously throughout the year they have she has her maintenance requirements and then during pregnancy they start to creep up into the last trimester where her pregnancy requirements are the highest and then once she her lactation requirements increase even further right through to peak lactation and then start to reduce down as her milk production drops off. During lactation, you can see that in a tougher season with the peak lactation, her cow's hormones are actually still driving her to produce milk. This is where if her energy requirements are not being met through poor quality, poor quantity and quality pasture, she would actually continue to drag down her condition score quite significantly, which is why we're talking about early weaning here today. You can see in front of you the body condition score of a cow is really important. I guess from if you've never done it before, what I mean by body condition scoring is you're actually getting your hands on them. You're measuring. So I tend to go straight to the backbone and I'm measuring the shape of the eye muscle through to the short ribs. So for condition score three, there's a little bit of the backbone is not prominent. There's a bit of fat between the actual vertebrae. The Eye muscle is flat between the backbone and the short ribs, and there's a bit of fat in between the short ribs too. We also look at the tail and how much fat is around the tail. And then obviously, as they get skinnier, these things become more prominent with less fat around the tail, short ribs, backbone, and also you can see their pin bones a little bit more, more prominent on condition score two. I guess what we're aiming for calving is condition score three. However, for autumn carvers, I prefer them closer to condition score three due to the lower quality of pasture on offer. And I guess feeding a lot through autumn as well. So if we aren't quite meeting her energy requirements with hay, we've got a little bit of room to move where she's actually using her energy stores to feed that calf. A trigger point for early weaning, which is what why we're here today, condition score. We want to manage our cow herd condition score. When, once they start calving, we don't really want the average of the herd to go below condition score two and a half. This is purely for rebreeding rates. We don't want to drag so much condition off of her that it's affecting our rejoining rate. And also we want to make sure that she's still producing good amounts of milk and we haven't stripped it all off of her. So that leads into my cow fertility. So if we are stripping back condition scores to say two and a half, we're going to have on average condition score two to 2.8. We might not have many threes at this stage, just given the season. So what we're looking at here is our PPAI, so past postpartum anaesthetic interval. I like to describe this as 
the days to their first heat cycle post calving. So how long it takes them to cycle after calving. So if we're at condition score two and a half or two for calving, what this is saying on low feed, because that's what we're experiencing at the moment, it's saying that we've got 65 days until that cow will actually cycle again. Having a high condition score, as you go along, you can obviously see that as their high condition score, the days to their first heat cycle post-calving is reduced. And at condition score three, we're up around 45 days. And then condition score three and a half to four, we're at 38 days. If we're aiming for one cow per calf per year, and her days of pregnancy is 200 days, we've actually got eight, only 83 days to get her back in calf. If it's taking 65 days for that first heat cycle to come on, we're actually only giving her potentially one cycle to get in calf. This actually flows through. You can see their pregnancy rates on low feed at condition score two. Our pregnancy percentages are down at 70, whereas at condition score three to two and a half, it's 87 Obviously, as we progress further in the season, we're hoping that we do get a spring. And for those later joinings on high feed, we've still got a little bit of room to move. and We can make it up into the 90s for those better condition scored cows. So weaning equals a feed saving. So approximately 30% um, reduction in energy requirements when feeding cows and calves separately compared to an actual lactating cow. A lot of energy goes into producing milk. It's very nutrient dense. We're producing a lot of liters and that takes up a lot of energy. This is a big saving. When I've seen like most of the paddocks I've been looking at recently are like the one on your screen, very low kilograms of dry matter. There might only be a couple of hundred kilos in the paddock. What is growing is getting nipped off quite quickly because only the pasture is only growing at probably 15 to 10 to 15 kilograms of dry matter per hectare at the moment. So it's very slow and steady. Hoping, fingers crossed, tomorrow we get the rain that we're forecasted for to help keep this along. But unfortunately, probably the frost that we've had has slowed it up pretty quickly. So yeah, 30% feed saving just by weaning, which is one of the reasons why we're weaning and why we're talking about it. When to wean. So I always talk about with the clients that I work with, it's a bit of an age and weight consideration. It's a bit of a sliding scale. So what I mean by that is you can see on the graph here, we're looking at the nutrient requirements from milk versus from forage of that calf. And you can see that at first and first initially when they're born, they're hundred percent getting their nutrients from milk. And then as they get older, their nutrient percentages start flipping. So at around three months of age, they're still at 70% reliant on milk and 30% on their for on forages. That's usually pasture, but in this situation, it would be whatever you're feeding your cows. So hay, grain, pellets, whatever you're feeding your cows, the calves will start nibbling at. And you can see it just gradually tapers off down to around six months of age you're only receiving 20% of their nutrient requirements from milk. And yeah, m majority of their requirements are actually coming from what they're grazing anyway. So drought weaning can occur from three months of age. In those situations, because the calf would be very light and such a large portion of their diet is milk, you have to consider actually using milk replacers. So we can wean really early. We know we can do that from the dairy industry. It's just from a commercial perspective, the labor and intensity of that really has to be weighed up. Yeah, we the minimum age I would go for is three months. Average age for the industry norm is six to 10 months of age. And that is as you can see on the graph, the re reliance on milk dramatically reduces post six months. And also from a weight perspective, the older they are, the heavier they're going to be. And this also makes it a lot easier to wean. So I tend to go for minimum 100 kilos weaning weight. This is to reduce the labor that I was just talking about. We are going 
under 100 kilos, the ration changes quite dramatically in the fact that we've got to be using really high protein feeds like canola meal, soybean meal or milk replacer, nutrient dense that takes up very little room in the rumen to help hit crude protein percentages of say 18 to 19 percent in this ration. If we were going to wean a calf that was only 60 kilos, they can only eat roughly 1.8 kilos of dry matter a day. So it's not very much. We're trying to squeeze lots of energy and lots of protein into that diet to keep them growing. So once they're over 100 kilos, it becomes a lot easier. We can reduce the percentage of crude protein in their diet and they can eat that little bit more as well. From a rumen development perspective, so I guess what you're looking at is a calf rumen. Early on in the life of a calf, it actually functions as a monogastric. So the esophageal groove essentially blocks the pathway to the rumen and flows to the abomasum. So they're essentially functioning like us as a monogastric and everything is absorbed in the abomasum. The rumen does not start developing until they reach 12 to 16 weeks of age. And based on the last slide at this age, they're only consuming 70 to 55% of their diet as forage. This is where the esophageal groove begins to open up and actually allow pasture into the rumen um, because they're starting to forage harder. They're starting to try what mum's eating. And yeah, it's just a natural process that occurs. As they get older, their rumen further develops, increasing in size. So the actual amount of litres that they consume will increase. And also it increases in thickness, like the rumen wall increases in thickness. So you can see on the left, this is a rumen with milk only. And this in the middle is with milk and hay. You can see the colour difference and it just seems to be that bit thicker. So with thicker mus, sorry, with a thicker rumen, the muscle actually can contract harder and work harder to help break down feed stuffs. But also with the colour change, it's also suggesting that there's higher blood flow to that area, which means nutrient absorption is, is a lot better. And as you can see, with if we increase the ration from a hay to, say, a grain, for example, and this is a starch-based grain, it actually increases rumen development further those little papillae are increasing the surface area of the rumen to further enhance nutrient absorption. One of the things that is really beneficial of rumen development is improved feed efficiency. So with starch-based grains, we know this drives rumen fermentation. Starch increases the number of bugs in the rumen. It helps break down feed. It is the most efficient energy that's absorbed to the animal and I guess when we're using these efficient feeds like starch that is so easily digestible and absorbed, it's like the Ferrari of feeds. It's very efficient, but we have to manage it really appropriately to help avoid acidosis. These animals with rumens like the one on the right can be efficient animals for life. So if you're keeping replacement heifers, they will actually have better feed efficiency for their life because their rumen has been set up. What we don't want to do is undo all of our good work and cause acidosis or we might be putting them onto a lush green feed and they scour and they get like SARA from partial acidosis. So we have to be really be careful about that rumen environment and that muscle and to keep it as efficient as possible. So just to recap for when to wean, I'd be waiting until calves are three to four months of age and we're targeting minimum 100 kilos live weight. If you're finding yourself in a situation where it's going to be detrimental to weight, it's okay to wean earlier than this. Um, I would just highly recommend speaking to a livestock consultant or advisor before you go ahead just to make sure your setup, your ration, everything is tippy top to help make those animals increase in weight gains and improve their survival. So it is possible, but they're the kind of targets that I'm looking for. So when managing stress, I think when we talk about early weaning, one of the biggest things that I find with producers is the stress of it. They're worried that 
if I early wean, my animals are going to go backwards for a period of time before they actually start going ahead. You can undo the good work of your sappy weaner and they end up looking a bit dry in the tip and a bit woody. As long as we're managing stress and managing good nutrition, I don't think that's a problem. Whether you're yard weaning, your paddock weaning. So obviously a rup separation is a pretty big stress for early weaning animals. So down around a hundred kilos, I actually don't recommend paddock weaning just because we really need to look after them and putting them out in a paddock and saying, see you later and putting mum on the opposite side of the property is just not really suitable for this weight range. I don't think. There's gradual separations, having adjoining paddocks with mum on one side, the calf on the other, and they can still talk to each other and sniff or whatever, but they actually can't physically drink. And then maybe after four or five days, you're moving them on because it's they're weaned and they seem to have reduced stress. So regardless of which um, scenario you're using, I would absolutely be imprint feeding. So One of the biggest stress when calves come off mum is that they don't know what's going on. Their stress support is mum, they're comforted by milk, and that's all of a sudden gone. And stress can be really detrimental to the weaning process. It can cause them to dehydrate because they're urinating and defecating a lot. This causes their immune system to be suppressed and stress reduces appetite. So if we've reduced their appetite because they're stressed, they're not going to be eating as much, which means their nutrient absorption is also going to be low. When we don't manage stress, we can also put a big tail in the mobs. Yeah, we want to reduce that as well. So I always recommend minimum three times in the last week before weaning. I think this year we've got some of the best imprinted stock just because we've been feeding for so long. If you are thinking about you've been feeding hay and silages and you're looking at doing an early weaning program for those 100 to 150 kilo type calves imprinting with grain the week leading up to would absolutely be beneficial and if you're using any type of troughing or tubs any type of feeding system that they have not been exposed to I would be doing this on mum as well acceptance of feed is really important in that that age bracket and we want them to be going on to feed really quickly stress relief products there's a lot there's a lot of products out on the market i've been asked a lot about them recently i don't think they're a bad thing i actually use some of them in my recommendations which products is best for you really depends on your system and i'd be talking to either your livestock advisor or wherever you buy your animal health from As a minimum, your stress relief products should contain electrolytes and magnesium to help replenish muscle stores that have been depleted through that stressful period. If we're keeping them, if we're keeping them restored, they're less likely to go off feed. They're more likely to start eating. And I guess by reducing stress, we're really starting to initiate that appetite and get them to feed. Adequate nutrition is also really important of managing stress. So having a balanced diet, making sure they feel full. There are feeding systems out there where we can feed them grain and meet their energy requirements really easily, but they're actually not full yet. And by having a little bit of hay in the diet, for example, so they can top up and feel full and feel comfortable and not stress about where their next portion of their meal is coming from that can work wonders as far as reducing stress as well improving calf survival so what one of the big things with this weight range is they're very easily um very easy to lose weight through this period so one of the things we don't want to do is have a 100 to 150 kilo calf going backwards that is a recipe for high mortality rates The research suggests that we should be gaining a minimum of 600 grams per head per day from weaning until they're 250 kilos live weight to avoid calf losses post weaning. I would say this, you know, if we're trying to put 100 kilos on at 0.6 kilos per head per day, we'll be looking at 
strategies of how to mitigate that and make it as they get a bit heavier to reduce the labour input. So at the start, we might have a really intense feeding program for the first 45 to 60 days. And then they might go to more of a grain assisting type program, which is a lot less grain and a lot less labour. So there are ways that we can get even this out to make it more attainable through that period. One of the things that we also look for is growth rates. This is just an example of growth rates uh, required between weaning and mating to reach our critical mating weight of 300 kilos. So our critical mating weight um, in this scenario of 300 kilos is based on a standard reference weight of 500 kilos. So that's mature cow weight at condition score three that are more than three years old. So if you don't know your standard reference weight of your cows from the, I guess the producers I've been involved with have been surprised once measured it, that it's actually higher than what they initially thought. They probably were budgeting on 500 kilo cows and they've worked out they've actually got 580 or 620 kilo cows as their standard reference weight. So working that out is really important because then we can base these targets for the critical mating weight of 60% of mature body weight. Um, We can actually work out, okay, if they're 200 kilos, they need nearly half a kilo head per day growth rate. Yeah, those lighter carbs will obviously, for our replacement heifers, probably need to actually be gaining 0.6 of a kilo per head per day um, to even meet their critical mating weights at 15 months of age. So it's just something to bear in mind uh, when planning your replacement heifers. So calf requirements, from a ration perspective, the, when I guess when I would be coming out on farm and looking at what feeds to use, for early weaning, I'd be looking at feed stuffs that are greater than 10 me, greater than 15% crude protein. As a total diet, I definitely want more than 30% NDF. And then once we've worked all of that out, um, we can talk about macros and vitamins. Pardon me. So I guess when we're dealing with these lighter carbs, energy density is really important because they actually can't physically eat a lot and protein is just so important for growth rates so we could be meeting their energy requirements no problems with barley for example but if their ration is flat out at 10 percent crude protein they'll grow but they'll get to a point where they probably start to look a bit woody they're not rounding out and they're not looking like a fresh sappy calf that's because we haven't been meeting their energy requirement, uh, protein requirements, sorry. Protein is really important for them to lay down muscle. So for those early weaning programs, I'm looking for 16% crude protein. And if we're looking at anything under a kilos, I'd be aiming for more like 18 or 19% crude protein of the ration. Once we've got all that sorted, energy starch-based energy is really important. So I'd be looking to barley, wheat, corn. I've switched a lot of people to corn that have run out of barley recently. All good feedstuffs that are suitable for this job. Protein, it might be a loosened hay. I've seen a lot of vetch hay getting around it at the moment. If you've still got any lupins or canola meal, I'm finding those are becoming very hard to source. But if you did have any left, um, that's what I would be using. With your macros, once we've got all the nutrition stuff sorted out we'd tend to look at calcium so for a calf that is growing their calcium requirements are really high because we've been on such high grain and hay rations for such a prolonged period of time if you haven't been supplementary supplementing calcium that can actually hinder their growth rates so depending on what the ration is we'd be looking at adding in calcium if it wasn't already in an additive that you were using. Calcium is really important for skeletal development and muscle growth. Vitamins, AD and E is so important. I've seen quite a few vitamin E deficiencies this season, which typically for me in the southeast is not very common, but I've definitely seen three or four. And so, you know, AD and E is typically not 
yeah, not something we think about with green feed because vitamin A and E are synthesized through the beta keratin in green feeds. Once we've been three months without green feed, that's when generally our A and E starts depleting quite rapidly. How we get that to them really depends on your system and every, I think every recommendation will be different. So our food targets, normally at this time of year, we're not necessarily looking at what what energy density of our supplementary feed we need for weaning. Usually we've got some green feed that's up and about. Usually I would say minimum 1,200 kilos of dry matter per hectare of green pasture for early weaned ca- calves. I have not found a paddock that looks like this in a long time. Uh, if you've got it, you could definitely utilize it and use the green feed as a portion of their protein requirements. So keep that in mind. Yeah, if you're looking at doing a ration on onto something like this, we could definitely do more of a grain assisting type job. If we were going to go grain, no supplementary feed, we really need there to be 15 to 1800 kilograms of dry matter per hectare of green pasture at 70% digestibility to achieve that 600 grams per head per day of weight gain. I think we're a fair way off that right now. And at the growth rates of 10 to 15 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, it's going to take us a long time to get to that. So chances are we're going to have to be supplementing something. How hard we go, that all depends on your property. But yeah, I just wanted to put up those food on offer targets. So calf energy requirements. If you're looking at this table, these are the energy and protein requirements for growing heifers that are requiring 0.8 kilos of growth rate per head per day. So you can see here that if we're going to 100 kilo calf, their maximum daily, sorry, maximum dry matter intake is 3.1 kilograms per day. The total energy requirements is 27 megajoules of energy per, per head per day to achieve. 800 grams per head per day weight gain and the percentage of that diet that we'd be aiming for is 19. Now I tend to look at the weight spread of the uh, mob that we're weaning so if we've yes we might have the tail enders at 100 kilos but if that mob average is a little bit higher around um, 140 kilos for example and we can only achieve 16% crude protein in the diet, then those little ones, they'll be okay. They will still survive. They will still put on weight. It's when we significantly reduce their crude protein um, concentrations down around maintenance, we'll have some big troubles. Yeah, it's really hard because at this end of the season, we might not have a lot of things on offer that are really high in protein, but we're certainly aiming if we can Closer to 19 for those really light ones. But yeah, I'd be trying to definitely minimum 16 sick crude protein of their total ration. As they get bigger, they can consume more, which is why, as you can see, the crude protein required in their diet drops off. They can just physically eat more, which you can see their dry matter intake up the top increases as well. So I've put together this feed budget. So this is just an example of a ration, a hundred kilo calf gaining eight, sorry, 0.8 kilograms per head per day. We're targeting 27 ME and 16% crude protein. I purely used what I thought I've had a couple of guys come to me to say that they had barley and vetch hay. So I've just purely used those numbers. I could not get just on vetch hay alone. I could not get those numbers up around 19% crude protein but we could still easily attain 16%. One kilo per head per day of barley and two kilos per head per day of vetch is what I needed to achieve 27 ME and 16, 16% crude protein in the diet. I just want to say, if you're thinking about weaning and using this ration, do feed test everything that you want to feed at weaning. It makes a massive difference when formulating a ration. And especially if you're going to be using hay and silages, the NDF content will actually significantly impact consumption of those cards. So the NDF is a measurement that you would see on your feed test. 
It's neutral detergent fiber. It describes the makeup of cell walls of the plant and is the proportion of fiber of like cellulose and lignin and hemicellulose. So it's directly related to the bulk of feed and it impacts how much forage they can actually intake. If the NDF is higher, these calves will not be able to eat as much as what they would if their NDF was lower. So on your vetch and loosen hay, your ND might be around 40, 45%. But on your cereal hay, so if you only had oat and hay left, for example, your NDF might be higher up around 8 or 60% NDF, which means that the oat and hay would fill those calves up quicker and they wouldn't be able to eat as much. And when we're dealing with such small calves how much we can get into them is really important so get your feed test done I yeah highly recommend it so I've also put a little bit of a clause in here to say this ration I'm targeting the live weight of 105 kilos on this ration the reason I'm saying this is because as they get bigger they can consume more so if we're going to be feeding these 100 kilo calves right through to say 2 250 kilos as they get bigger we actually have to adjust their ration for how much they can eat i've just done a quick feed budget and that's why this is only for 60 days so 200 calves for one week we'll eat 200 kilos of barley and 400 kilos of vetch hay and for 60 days that's 12 tons of barley and 24 tons of vetch hay So that's basically saying in 60 days at 0.8 kilo gain per head per day, we'll achieve 150 kilos. So that's my workings behind it. If you want to go longer, we just up, I could, I would just sit there and work out what the next increments of rations are. And we'd just, yeah, keep completing the feed budget for how long you were keeping these animals off. If, If it was a short term thing, Yeah, it's obviously quite easy, but if you're growing out heifers for their first joining, then we can, as time goes on, do something that's less intensive, get them up to 250 kilos, and then you might switch to more of a grain assisting scenario where pasture has started to grow again. We might be coming into spring and we start dropping the grain ration because the pasture consumption is overtaking and meeting a lot more of their energy requirements than what there are now. So obviously, if we don't get a spring, we would continue to hand feed in more of a confinement situation. But yeah, as pasture comes on, we can definitely change it to be less laborsome. One of the biggest things when we look at using these these rations and starting to feed them high concentrations of grain. So for a 100 kilo wiener, I would max out their ration at 1.5 kilos of grain. I I don't like going over that. I think it's a big whack of grain for that weight. What I'm what I tend to do is look at induction to starch. So starch, like I said earlier, is so important for rumen development and increasing the number of bugs in the rumen to have better feed efficiency. And I guess what I, you don't want to undo all of that good work by giving them acidosis. Gradual introduction. This is a an example. So the reason I've kept at 250 grams per head is because on day one, you won't get every animal coming to the feed. It might take two or three days, depending on how well they're imprinted, to, for the whole mob to come onto the feed. So I don't like increasing the amount of grain that you're feeding until they're all there, they're all competing for the feed. Because what happens is if day two and three, you increase it by 200 grams and on day three, you're actually at 600 grams, let's say, that is enough to cause acidosis for those shire feeders that haven't come onto the grain quickly. And that can be detrimental to causing a tail in your mob and also their lifetime feed efficiency, depending on how bad the acidosis is. Obviously, acidosis can cause death as well, so we want to avoid that. Acidosis occurs when the pH of the rumen falls below 5.5 and it usually sits around 6.5 to 7, so we want to manage that environment. Another way that we can manage that environment is with functional fibre. 
by functional fibre. The fibre is usually the width of their mouth, not chaff. Chaff will not cause the, I guess, the scratch factor and that the contraction mechanism to break down feed and move everything in the room and around for absorption purposes and things. Functional fiber is what I'm after that can help slow down or well, it can help fill them up, but also help dilute acid um, in their system. The other thing we can do is give additives in their rations, whether that is a, a 4% additive or you might want to make your own or if we're actually feeding a full complete pellet the additive will be in it so you're buffering like acid buff bicarb soda calcium they might even be using some bentonite those additives are generally already in pellets ask the question if you don't know ask the question Um, but generally if, if you're using a calf rearer or like a calf feedlot pellet that will already be built into it and so will the minerals yeah additives really important for neutralizing acid and yeah acidosis can obviously lead to poorer feed efficiency and a lot of research is starting to suggest that even with subclinical acidosis it immunosuppresses the cars and it makes it easy to pick up other infections so subclinical acidosis that you actually can't see might be the precursor to them getting BRD or more susceptible to worms or pink eye, for example, because their immune system is not working adequately. With your introduction to grain, this is purely for a 100 kilo, 100 to 150 kilo animal or different weight ranges. So for larger weight ranges, I tend to increase it by more than 200 grams per head per day but for the sake of this presentation I've gone conservative so keep in touch with your livestock advisor it might be your induction program might look slightly different to this health is obviously really important with managing the calves at weaning so keeping them up to date pulpy kidney is will be massive because they're going on to a intensive ration that's really high energy pulpy kidney is going to be a really big one to watch out for. So keep up to date with your 71 vaccinations, give them their booster shot and they count calves in the lead up to weaning if you can, drench if required. Otherwise, I would say most of the producers I'm working with give a blanket drench at weaning anyway. But if you are able to do a fecal egg count in the lead up to weaning, that is best practice. And then monitoring every 28 days after you've drenched just to keep on top of worm if they're out in a small paddock and have access to pasture where there would be high worm burdens. I've already mentioned it, ADE this season has been really important. I would definitely consider giving an ADE injection or drench depending on what you feel comfortable with. Some guys don't want to do another injection, which is absolutely fine. It's completely up to you guys, but definitely to help with their growth and their immune system, um, vitamin A and E is going to be really important. Trace mineral deficiencies. I'm obviously in the limestone coast, copper, selenium, cobalt are really important mineral deficiencies down here and will absolutely hinder your growth rates. So if you do have a known trace mineral deficiency, still treat for that. And then we can maintain that with feed additives in your grain ration. So implementing all of this. So when we come to actually putting this all to practice, we've got our three to four month old calves, they're minimum 100 kilos, and we've gone, yep, we're going to wean. What do we actually need? So from an infrastructure point of view, how do we actually do this? If we're feeding grain, or pellets, 30 centimetres per head trough space is really important. The trough space will influence shy feeders. If not all cattle can line up at once, the number of shy feeders are likely to increase and they'll be quite, it'll be quite a stark contrast because obviously being that light, they'll lose weight quite rapidly. Feeder space is absolutely critical. Weight ranging, no more than 50 kilos. If you've got 
wieners and you've got an 80 kilo weight range, I would be splitting them into 40 kilo weight ranges and having half and half or however it works out. Yeah, I would definitely be weight ranging because those heavier animals are absolutely going to be bullying out those lighter ones. And those lighter ones might not actually be shy feeders. They might actually just be the ones that were dropped last and haven't had as better access um, to the feed as what the other ones have. Pen stocking density, up to four metres squared per head for 180 to 260 kilo calves is normally what we work off. Because we are dealing with lighter ones with this early weaning, you can go down to two and a half metres squared per head for 100 to 170 kilo calves. Water daily, clean it. I can, even just a light little dust film over the top can turn calves off of their water. They can be quite finicky. If you are in a yard weaning scenario, a grain dropping to the bottom of the trough, that can affect the taste. Having grain sitting on the bottom fermenting can definitely turn calves off water too. So keep it clean. I guess the length of the yard weaning process, I've put two to seven days in pens. It's more, this is more determined on the producer and what they want, what they usually do, but also it, it's reasonably decided by the response of the calves. So when the calves stop bellowing, they eat well, they walk straight, they're, they've been taught how to stop. They're not just bolting to one side of the pen when they see humans or a dog. They've actually started to calm down and settle in. So, you know, you've done that initial two to seven days in a proper yard pen. We're introducing grain and then we might after that, depending on your infrastructure, we can either hold them in there or move them out to a smaller paddock and use like a troughing system like in the photos here, either up against the fence or can be accessed both sides. It's really what you've got available. Mob sizes, typically we try to keep mob sizes to 100. However, this is not always manageable. Just be mindful that if you are going in mob sizes of more than 100, you are more likely to get more shy feeders. It's not a hard and fast rule, but that's when your feeder space will be really critical and you'll have to keep an eye out on shy feeders and pull them out accordingly. As soon as you start seeing them, so it might be within the first week, I would actually start pulling the shy feeders out and managing them differently because you don't want them to just waste away in the pen. You actually want to identify them and get them out quite quickly because typically they won't adapt to that situation. You quite often, no matter what the feeding system is, whether you're doing early weaning or feed lotting, you're likely to get maybe 1% of shy feeders. So it's likely it's going to happen. Just have a different pen set aside for them and we can manage them differently. Releasing from yards. Once, once we get a bit of feed and we're hitting our food targets, we've got... 1,500 kilos to 1,800 kilos out in the paddock of green green pasture, what we can do is start transitioning them out. So from yard weaning that kind of two to seven intense days in the yards, we might actually go to a small paddock like what, you've, what you can see in front of you. So there's pens, but they're still big enough that they can go off and graze a little bit. It's almost like a sacrifice paddock scenario they might only be five acres it, it's not a massive paddock it's but it's enough to keep them on the ration and they're not it's not big enough that they're going to be running off a heap of energy trying to find feed it's just so that they don't have to be in proper yards for a prolonged period of time what we tend to do is move the troughing with the mob so if your troughing is not permanent we'd move it with the mob and actually start gradually reducing the amount of grain that we're feeding. If we're feeding a kilo and a half of grain, for example, over probably a week period, we'd just gradually reduce the amount of grain being fed, keep the hay out, I wouldn't change that, and just manage that transition from grain and hay to pasture, reducing the amount of grain that they're consuming. The hay is still there, which is a constant the whole way. And then once the hay runs out, that should be a couple of weeks and their rumens should have gradually adapted to that feed change and that kind of spring feed that's coming on 
we're not seeing a heap of scouring or getting any of those animal health issues. We've ma- managed that transition really well. And obviously keeping on top of your worm egg counts is really important, especially if it's a really productive paddock and you know that there's a bit of a high worm burden there. Keep on top of that. And yeah, they should keep growing on that feed and hopefully hit all of your growth rates and survival targets. Thank you for joining. If you've got any questions, feel free to give me a call. I'm based out of Rowe, but I'm happy to answer a call from anyone and put you in contact with people more local to you or if you are in the limestone coast, more than happy to come visit. Great. Thanks, Ash. One of the questions for you, Ash, is what options are there for supplying high protein to early wean calved destined for grass-fed programs where grain feeding is not permitted? Is lucerne or vetch hay adequate? Yep. Lucerne and vetch hay are feed testing. That would be my, if you do have lucerne or vetch hay, do feed tests, see where you're at. If your vetch hay or lucerne hay is testing 19, 9 and a half, 19.5% crude protein, that would be adequate. If it's only testing down around 14 or 15, um, it might not necessarily um, be enough. But I would definitely be looking at what what else you've got if it's not if you're in a small paddock scenario or that if you do have any food I don't know what's in your paddock obviously but yeah we can definitely do something with the higher protein loosen and vetch haze. Thanks Ash. Is ringworm also from deficiency? I think that was related to when you were talking about acidosis maybe. Yeah, ringworm is just generally something that pops up when their immune system is compromised. Yeah, absolutely. If we've got subclinical acidosis and their immune system is suppressed, they will be more likely to contract something like ringworm. But making sure that um, their acidosis risks are mitigated through good induction programs, we're looking at what minerals we're supplying them to keep their immune system fighting off infection we can definitely avoid it do you have a suggested ration for half paddock size for this transition you mentioned five acres for how many would that be in five acres you might only have about two 250 in a mob and that's probably more so to reduce shy feeders you could probably on a per meter basis have more than that but i find once you're actually managing the mobs, it doesn't really matter how big the paddock is, you want smaller mobs for that intensive feeding. Once we go out into a grain assisting type job where we're actually out in a proper big paddock and spring feed is coming on, that's when we can box mobs together because the actual amount of grain that they're, I guess, we're allocating them for the day is lower. Having more competition is actually better to help keep those lower consumption rates, if that makes sense. That does. Thanks, Ash. Thank you again for everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, And Ashley, thank you for sharing your insights and expertise. It's been a really interesting session. I once again have to thank our partners who have uh, supported this webinar. So it's AgResilience through, it's a Livestock SA program that is part of the Farm Business Resilience Program, an initiative of the Commonwealth Government Future Drought Fund and the Department of Primary Industries and and Regions. So it's always grateful to have uh, great funding bodies to be able to put these things on and, and bring you the information that you need at the time you need it. Thank you. Have a good evening and um, look forward to hopefully seeing you at a future webinar or workshop. Thanks.